So good afternoon, everyone. Um, before I get into my, the nitty gritty of my global action plan, I want to start off by posing a question. Is access to water a right in Canada? And of course, all of us sitting in this room would say, yes, of course it is. I, as a Canadian citizen, I should definitely have fresh water. But unfortunately, that's not the reality for over 300,000 Canadian people living in Canada. And that community is our First Nations, the true and rightful owners of the land we now call Canada. And so today, for my Global Action Plan, I'm going to be highlighting the issues around sanitation and access to clean water that exists within First Nations communities. Today in my presentation, I'm going to be first be going over some background research and really contextualize an issue that stretches over hundreds of years. I'm going to be going into the causes of the issue and some lessons that NGOs and governments have learned so far with already trying to deal with this issue. Then I'm going to be going on to outline my global action plan. I'm going to be talking a little bit about some risks that are associated with, with what I intend to implement. And then I'm going to conclude by wrapping everything up and um, summing together my research and my plan. First, a little bit about an issue. So when we talk about access to clean water from drinking and sanitation, we're talking about water we just use on a regular and daily basis to drink and consume, but also water that we use for toilets, showers, sinks, and bathing. And so we group fresh water into this broad category because in First Nations community, the fact that they have a poor access to this water really affects every facet of their life. It affects their ability to bathe in the morning, but also more broadly and importantly, it also affects their ability to simply consume water in general. Currently, 400 out of the 618 First Nations communities in Canada have had some kind of water problem between 2004 and 2014. And of the 851,000 First Nations people in Canada, two-thirds of them have a water advisory in effect. And just a little information about a water, of what a water advisory is. It's essentially a public health advisory that the government issues to say that drinking water is contaminated by um, elements like lead and excessive chlorine, or it may simply be that the fresh water system is no longer existent and people don't have access at all. In many cases around Canada, uh, we have what's called a boil water adv advisory, which means that numerous reserves are forced every single day to boil their water for approximately one minute before they're able to consume it or even use it for things like bathing. Of course, the issue has existed for many, of ye for many years, since the advent of colonialism and since settlers first arrived in Canada. But the issue really peaked when First Nations communities were essentially moved and relocated to not what we now call reserves from their traditional land and traditional territory. And this issue is actually on the rise. So the amount of water advisories and boil water advisories that are currently being instituted in First Nation reserves is on the rise. And more more and more reserves are either facing more contaminants in their water, or if they had access to water, those sources are now being lost due to environmental issues or just the fact that they're no longer receiving funding or infrastructure assistance to maintain access to that water. But the more important issue is that in a country like Canada, where we have such a high quality of living and an effective government system, why exactly has the issue persisted? Well, there's a, a couple of numerous reasons, actually, but I've decided to pick out the main ones. The first is not recognizing First Nations as unique groups of individuals. So across Canada, even if you just go from one reserve to another in the same province, you're going to have a different set of people with a different set of beliefs. And so the way they view um, water in their life is going to be different. Some may say that it's not effective enough to put the water through um, a certain kind of to water treatment plant because it goes against their spiritual norms and spiritual customs, while others may say that it's not correct for them to have water brought in from outside of their province or outside of the native land. So to recognize every single First Nations reserve as unique groups of individual that we can't apply broad generalizations or solutions to is incredibly important. And in the past, the government and NGOs have applied these broad generalizations to First Nations reserves, which has meant that the solutions have not been effective across the board. 
Second issue is a lack of consistent monitoring. So in Canada, we have municipal level, provincial level. Uh, we even have small city levels, and we have our federal government. What that means, though, is that at the municipal, provincial, and federal level, there's essentially what we can call First Nation bureaus and First Nation departments, all of whom are responsible for dealing with First Nations issues and First Nations water security. But what happens is that at certain levels of the government, one department might say, no, that's actually for the provincial legislation to take care of. And the provincial legislation can say, no, that's actually for the federal legislation to take care of. What that means is that there's a complete lack of communication between governments. So if one body says that they're going to get something done, it actually doesn't end up happening until much later, or it doesn't end up happening at all. The third thing is, and most obvious thing, is of course just colonial history. The fact that First Nations people today did not choose where they wanted to live. Uh, they were essentially forced in many, in many cases off their land through violence um, and, and violent conflict, or they were forced to sign legal treaties, which in reality just served to disadvantage them and take away their resources and native land. The fourth thing, and these two can really be mixed together, is that there's no access to effective protection from groundwater contaminants, and that's largely because First Nations communities are currently reliant on government financing, which means that they have a lack of capital to deal with the issues by themselves. So even if they are able to address and acknowledge the issues, they don't have that infrastructure or access to capital, which allows them to deal with the issues at all. A few lessons that have been learned so far by those who have tried to address this issue. The first, like I said, is that while I stress the importance of recognizing every community as being unique, that in itself is also a challenge. Because it means that you can't design a model and we can say that this is going to be used for all the reserves you can see on that board. Which means that in some ways, it's about picking and choosing for each reserve what you think will work best and trying to implement the best model that can help the most people. The second thing is that there are complex legal and governmental barriers that exist. For example, you have the Indian Act, which was instituted by the government of Canada that has lots of regulations around what First Nations people can or cannot do. And some of these legal barriers especially are difficult, especially in the land parameters around what First Nations people are allowed to do with their land and how far um, they are essentially allowed to stay within or outside of the land. The third thing, and I'm going to be talking a lot about this in my, in my my global action plan is that some issues are not systemic. And what I mean by that is some issues can't be solved through government legislation or are not the fault of lack of financing. For example, environmental racism and racism in general, the fact that there's lots of stereotypes, generalizations, and racism against First Nations people that have existed in the past and continue to pervade Canadian society currently. And while these issues can't be or don't manifest on paper um, and we can't really see them, they still indirectly affect the buy-in from Canadian people, but also people's willingness to commit and help issues, especially if they have lots of preconceived notions and stereotypes about First Nations people. But the, a little bit now into the Global Action Plan. So there's three main goals that I want to uh, accomplished hopefully by the end of my global action plan. The first is raising awareness within Canada. So like I first said, I think that the success of an issue like this is not entirely dependent on financing and uh, infrastructure. It's also dependent on getting buy-in and involvement from the overall Canadian public. And I'm going to be essentially doing this through a media campaign, which I'm going to be fleshing out in greater detail later on. The second goal is receiving government assistance. And the way to do that, I think, is for the government to recognize that the systemic problem exists and the disadvantage face. And the way I'd like to do that is through drafting a white paper. A white paper is a document that can be written by normal civilians of a democracy in which it's a bunch of extensive research and essentially a proposal that you submit to the government for their review and implementation. And it's important to note that there is no precedent for submitting a white paper uh, for the well-being of and water access for First Nations communities, and it's never been done before. So this is not a solution that's been taken. And, and I do think, though, that white papers can be a really effective medium for making change. And the third, and this is, I think, kind of implied, is just that we're, of course, always trying to research and identify innovative solutions to the problem. This isn't what I would say one of the main goals or focuses of my gap, because I think that's something, there's other elements that have to be established before we can do that. But it's, of course, something that I would like to strive for and also work on throughout the completion of the other goals. OK, now on to year one. So this 
my senior two year has been year one of my global action plan. And it's been really useful for a couple of things. The first, like I acknowledged earlier, is that considering this, that this issue has so many complex socioeconomic issues and really literally spans over hundreds of years, this year was incredibly useful for me to research and understand the issue to a greater extent. And especially acknowledge um, what, what the problem I want to focus on was specifically. Because there's lots of broad issues I think I could have focused on, water in general, or simply uh, the legal side of things, the practical side of things. But ultimately, I decided to focus on the practical side of things and just access to fresh water in daily life. And that was actually a really long contemplation process for me, because I found that there were so many different elements within and issues within First Nations communities that I could have um, chosen to focus on, but ultimately did come down after this research and contemplation to focusing on access to water specifically. So in year two, um, what I plan to do is identify a First Nations reserve near the University of Western Ontario, where I'll be attending school next year. And there's a couple of um, reasons and goals I hope to get from that. The first is essentially just to network with the community as a volunteer in general. That had always been a goal with my GAP, just to go in and help and work within a First Nations community and reserve um, through a, a bunch of different ways you could do this. Just, I think, to see the problem and understand the problem firsthand. And there's a couple of things that I would get from this. The first is incredibly useful research and data for the white paper. Because one really useful tactic for a successful white paper is a case study, in which you can demonstrate to the government this is an example of a First Nations reserve and how exactly the problem is affecting it and a solution that we can implement. And the second thing is compiling information for the media campaign. So let me now go into a little bit more information about what the media campaign entails, because it's very broad. So the goal of this media campaign is not necessarily to um, to immediately get funding or money from the Canadian public. But really, I think it's simply to raise awareness about this issue within society. Because currently, the majority of awareness raising campaigns and donations from Canada are all going outside of the country. They're all going to developing nations or NGOs that exist outside of Canada. And the issue with that is that for some reason, there's just this general apathy among the Canadian public. And it's as if we are continuing to hide from the fact that we have po large pockets in Canada that we can identify as developing or that have serious developmental issues. And so the media campaign is incredibly useful for raising that awareness and raising and creating that discourse within the Canadian public. The second thing within year two is talking to First Nations groups on campus. So a really excellent thing that many Canadian universities have is First Nations societies or First Nation groups, which bring together both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal youth to talk about issues. So making connections with individuals within these kinds of groups will be incredibly useful, especially going forward to talk and network with reserves. Also, First Nations studies faculties and departments will be very useful for research and the eventual publication of the white paper, and also compiling information that will be very useful for the media campaign. So year three is essentially, once this connection has been made with the community, it's important to establish what part of the plan is possible. Because one incredibly useful thing to acknowledge as someone who is not First Nations and someone who is not Aboriginal is to recognize that you are a foreign actor. You are someone who is working outside of the community and therefore has no right to say this is what should be done and this is what I th think you should do in order to address the problem. So that's why it's incredibly important and I think it's also important to recognize that some parts of the plan may not be feasible or possible and the community may not want them. That's why year three, I think, because it's in the middle, it's important to find out which part of the plans the community is open to and whether it's something that they believe is feasible and can be implemented. So the media campaign in this stage is essentially going to be modeled around encompassing Canada's problem. So the CBC, several years ago, near the time of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, published numerous amounts of stories from the survivors of um, schools, uh, residential schools among Canada. And within the Canadian population, and the Truth and Reconciliation Committee commented on this, it was really incredibly useful for the Canadian public to understand and reconcile with the past that their ancestors had forced upon First Nations communities and also recognize the disadvantage that exists. So I think modeling the media campaign among profiling the stories and the current conditions in First Nations reserves is really useful 
useful and incredibly impactful for the overall Canadian society. The second thing is to connect the community with a legal organization to assist with the white paper. So the Council of Canadians or Water Canada are two organizations that have been very, very active in working to fight for the legal rights of, ab of Aboriginal peoples to get access to fresh water on reserves. And while they've never worked within a white paper, they are still the best organizations that have large access to legal re resources and could network the reserve and myself with human rights lawyers who would be able to help implement the white paper later on in the future. For year four, this is hopefully going to be uh, the publication and implementation of the media campaign across Canada through um, obviously some form of medium, most likely the CBC, because they've always been open to these kinds of projects. Um, and with the white paper, in this year four, it's very important to establish for me the difference between a research white paper and a petition white paper. So really those are only the two kinds of white papers you can have. One is just a general research across the board in which you say to the government, this is a bunch of information we've compiled, do with it what you, what you would like. But the second is a petition, which is way more impactful, which addresses a concrete proposal or suggested points of action to the government that you think would be very useful. And why I left this decision so late in the Global Action Plan is because the first three years, I think, are really useful for compiling all that information. But in the fourth year, once you have a really good foundation and idea about the problem, it's an excellent time to establish what we think is going to be best to do with that large volume of information. Because at the end of the day, we may not be in a position and it may not be in the best interest of the community to say this is what needs to happen. It may just be better to compile a bunch of research, publish it, and see if someone else or the government can take that information and um, do something impactful with it. So year five, um, there's a couple of aspects of this. The first is essentially the response to the media campaign, uh, which is very, very important. Because the positive responses, which will hopefully will happen, will draw attention to what we can call innovative responses. So, after the Truth and Reconciliation Committee and that media campaign, there was a lot of social media campaigns that sparked after and a lot more conversation that happened among Canadian youth and among Canadian, Canadian society in general. So the hope is that this positive response will draw that same kind of discourse and same kind of movement in which people will begin to recognize and think more about the problem that exists and that will garner some innovative responses and innovative thinking around the issue. And the final, in the final year, we do intend to publish the white paper. And why that's important is because I think with those four years, there'll be plenty of time to author it and get lots of extensive academic guidance and legal guidance on the white paper. So year five is the best time to publish it, especially in wake of the media campaign, because you're not just highlighting the issue to the Canadian public, you're also saying that this is a solution and the research we comp compiled that can be implemented later on. Um, but of course, there's lots of risks and troubleshooting that come with this problem, which I want to quickly cut, uh, touch through before I conclude. The first, um, with the media campaign, I think is just broadly the spread of information and resisting the message. Um, essentially, you can think about that there's currently lots of stereotypes and misspread of information that happens with lots of marginalized groups across Canada. So through an improper or incorrect media campaign, I also run the risk of maybe doing more harm to these reserves and First Nations groups. But that's why I think it's incredibly important for a couple of things. The first thing is to establish and do a lot of extreme vetting with the media campaign before it's published. And secondly, which is not something that's been done before, is for people outside of the reserve not to publish data that the reserve does not want to be published. In many cases, um, academics and people who think that they're helping the issue think that it's okay just to publish large amounts of information or say what they think it should be done. But in the end of the day, I think through recognizing that it's only their approval that matters that we can prevent the misspread of information. Second thing is government response. I don't think this is something that's going to be um, a really, really large issue, but that's why I also talk about something like the white paper, because that's directly engaging with the government, and we're not making it as if um, we're working outside the government and trying to hide our actions and plan from the government. So I think working and talking with the government early and I think outlining these kinds of steps and parameters of what we intend to do is useful because then it prevents a scenario in which the government 
gets involved, shuts us down, or um, makes it so that the project cannot be possible due to some um, law that exists or, or other parameter. Um, clash with other communities is essentially just that maybe through focusing on one other reserve, do we run the risk of alienating others and making them not feel included? However, I think through the media campaign and white paper that we intend, I intend to eventually expand this outside of Ontario once that connection with the individual reserve has been made. So I think that risk can be mitigated as well. And um, this one is more racism and enforcing stereotypes. So whether we can further alienate First Nations people from receiving help in the event that the project doesn't go well, or there's more, uh, there's a more greater presence of racism and negative response from some of the steps I've outlined. But I think that through explaining the need and the problem that exists in a new and innovative way that hasn't been taken before, and using some of the effective mediums that we saw in previous years, that this problem can also be avoided. These two we can kind of group together because they're the more of the practical things. They're more um, of the practical elements put together, which is just the fact that the later innovative solutions that I talked about, which will hopefully be implemented, but which are a smaller goal, could eventually end up failing or not working. And again, I think that's really something to troubleshoot much later down the line, because at this stage, we're not even thinking or talking about practical solutions. We're talking about it more in macro terms as far as awareness and as far as bringing the government's attention to this. So I think those are things I'd much rather highlight and troubleshoot later on. But just to sum everything up and talk in big terms, uh, of course I acknowledge that this issue has existed for many years and has lots of complex social and systemic issues. But I think that one of the um, largest catalysts of successful movements like this has been through engaging the public, but also more importantly, putting enough pressure on the government that they're forced to act and forced to recognize the problem. And I think ultimately, overall, this gap serves to approach the problem from a new angle and bring equal access and rights to water for all First Nations people across Canada. Thank you. Thanks very much. Excellent job, Nikhil. I want to open it up to other folks for questions sure. first, if possible. Okay. Thanks, Nikhil. I, uh, I I was really enjoyed hearing you earlier in the hour when we talked about this project and let's see it's like really evolved a lot for you. So that's great. Um, I guess I'm curious in terms of um, the research you've done and how much you've been able to do in terms of what are the specific or predominant causes for water issues sure. on reserves have you done much of yeah that? I have yeah so I'm just thinking because um, you know if it's something to do with you know in some areas it's power dams and they're dredging mm -hmm. of mercury or in other areas it's toxic waste being dumped yep. those things are kind of infrastructure that has been put on reserves partly because of the racism you're talking definitely about. Um, but other things might be more about just water systems that are in place that aren't being kept up mm -hmm. do you have any sense of yeah. What the predominant ones are? Sure. Would you be willing to share a little bit about um, I think there's probably two or three main ones. The first is proximity to water sources. So for m predominantly, this is the main issue for reserves that are very, very far north, is that they're not near a large freshwater lake, river, or dam for that matter. So the majority of water they have is shipped or brought in to the reserve. The second issue is just cor is proximity, that you are near a freshwater source, but that freshwater source is contaminated with lead or high chlorine. And that's actually not um, too much because people are dumping. It's just because at the freshwater source, there's not um, a desalination plant or there's not a plant that can clean the water thoroughly enough. So those are probably the main two. Um, the other ones, as far as large amounts of waste being dumped, I think um, are present, but not as much as proximity and contamination of water sources. Because it feels like those are two very different things. And sure. that is also looking at... Um, the particular community you want to partner with. Mm -hmm. And so your overall goal, will it be to stay with working with that one community or the overall bigger? Yeah, I think I think work, why working with the individual community is good is because hopefully we can um, show a model of what success looks like right. and that success is possible for, for 
I think, changing the narrative that exists around what we perceive to be possible within First Nations Reserves. But the media campaign and white paper, I think, because it's just broad research, it is possible to have lots of reserves. But when we're talking about addressing the problem practically, the individual reserve, I think, will allow me just to focus mm -hmm. on that one thing, rather than stretch myself too far. All right. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, Akhil. I This is uh, obviously a very important issue uh, for all of us Canadians. I, I appreciated, in the risk assessment, I appreciated a lot of what you did, but how you addressed, anytime you're doing ethnographic research, that, that idea of misrepresentation, yeah. you really addressed that sure. nicely, I thought. So thank you so much for that, because that's not always easy to articulate. Um, just the media campaign uh, interests me a lot. I think, again, this is a story you're going to develop with a partner I understand, the, the partnering uh, mm -hmm. reserve that you'd be on. Do you see the sense like you're going to need money for this? What yeah. media? You mentioned CBC a, a, a few times. Could you just sure. a bit further? I know you might be still developing ideas. And yeah. Possible, but what are you kind of thinking? Yeah, it is still a little bit. Um, in develop, uh, developing, um, but I think um, for the particular me media campaign they did before, yeah. um, media organizations have been pretty good in in not requesting too much money for these kinds of media campaigns. Um, it, and the CBC it was the same thing with the, the piece they did around the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. Um, but I also think there's other organizations who do offer um, small subsidies and funding, like the Council of Canadians I mentioned as well. They're, um, that's all dependent though on you giving a project proposal to them. Yeah. So f there are organizations I think within Canada who are open to funding, but that would mean drafting very specific proposals to give them later on. And I think fundraising is for sure something um, I was considering. Um, I think that's just more dependent on that relationship I established with the community as well. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. I just want to make one comment, sort of question, um, because we've talked about this a lot this year, um, about you know the, the difficulty sometimes for that foreign actor coming in yeah. uh, with communities that feel that they, they are fully capable of self-empowerment. Absolutely. That, that, of course, is something that I know we've talked about in terms mm -hmm. of maintaining that in terms of trust is something sure. I would highly suggest. Sure. Um, and then the other aspect of that is the challenges you've had just in trying to contact folks yeah. this far. Yeah. Uh, we might want to note that. I know we're getting really close to end of time, but it might be good to note that for folks just to, you know, sure. what you have attempted, you know, at the initial stages. Of sure. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah, that part. Would you mind just mentioning? <laughs> oh, you asked me to talk about Sorry, that. that. Okay, good, good. Sure. good. Yeah, I wasn't sure. Sorry okay, sure. That. Yeah. So to Dr. Hurley's point, um, this is a really excellent part of the course, which is talking about communications and networking with people who specialize in the issue. Uh, and like Dr. Hurley mentioned, I'm, I reached out to several groups. One was an NGO organization that brings science students and their undergraduates to reserves to test water and um, essentially prove that there's poor water quality that exists. Uh, that's really big in, in Manitoba and Alberta. So I emailed several people within that organization because I was really interested in contact, contacting with them. Um, and I didn't get any responses back from them. And I'll hope that's because <laughs> email malfunction or something, and not just because <laughs> of pure. Um, but like Dr. Hurley said, I think there's always that risk of just someone sees someone from outside the reserve or someone who's coming in saying, I have a possible solution, and they just say, you know, reject you completely or say no, which is a, definitely, yeah, that is something I should have included in risk management, risk assessment, yeah. Well, I know we are at the end of time. I don't yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Nikhil, what you were starting to talk about there is exactly where I would be taking the questioning next is, is around really, um, like, and you've considered a lot of things as an outsider, um, and you've done that very sensitively, um, but yeah, that establishing of legitimacy and, sure. and establishing some kind of a relationship with the community so you yeah. can collaboratively identify a solution that will work for mm -hmm. that community, but I think that's kind of yeah. where, you're, where you're going. Yeah, one thing I didn't, I realized it, um, I omitted from the risk assessment was that uh, for the, especially the working of the media campaign, I did plan to have a point person within the reserve. Rather than try and engage with whether it be the tribal council as a whole or someone, have an individual who can act as that bridge rather than you just going in and doing that. That'd and I know better. some of the other things we've talked about are in terms of the Native Studies course and yeah. things like that. Yeah. Being able to chat with professors and things may give you some. Absolutely, because many have that. connections that exist. Yeah.
We are <laughs> Thank you Thank so you. much, everybody. Thank, Thank you very much.